next, uh, ladies and gentlemen, a pleasure to invite Professor Edward Ahrens from UC Berkeley. I just read that he received his PhD in 1972, and by now he has more than 90 graduate students and 18 PhD. So welcome, Ed. And his topic will be future development for thermal comfort, satisfying more with less. Oh, thank you. Um, can you all hear me? I'm very pleased to be able to follow these excellent presentations, and I can see that some of the things I'm able to talk about will fit in and add to the various uh, suggestions that have been made or presentation of uh, new ideas that have been made um, that are based largely on practical considerations and, uh, that what's going on in the industry. So I hope to be able to add a, a little bit there. The, the first point I want to make is that if you speak to the engineering profession, they often suggest that things are, if you're going to try some of these new things, particularly the use of air movement or dynamic uh, conditions, that you might interfere with the, the, the kind of the perfect environment that we currently have. And uh, the first point I really want to make is that things really aren't so great right now, uh, not just in terms of energy, but also the environment. Uh, and that the things that we're suggesting that you get from um, Didier and Chandra and, and Professor Chu especially, it might be a, a real opportunity for improving uh, the environment itself. So here we are, um, the occupant satisfaction is low. The, um, the, we all know the energy is, use is large, you'll see those in a second. And, and my big point is that energy is primarily being used in over conditioning. And my hypothesis really is that uh, is the restricted set point range that uh, Professor Didier talked about. Um, over ventilation at low loads, that's a new one. Um, and I'll talk about that. And it comes, interestingly, from the design of diffusers. Um, we'll think about that. Um, another point that hasn't been mentioned is that solar loads in buildings uh, affect not only the heating system, cooling system's ability to respond to the uh, solar loads across the space, but they also, solar loads may actually hit people. And at that point, uh, the temperature um, perceived by the person is changed. And it's interesting that no standard out there even mentions shortwave radiation. So I hope to uh, get that um, changed. Um, I don't have time to talk about controls, but really the main, the, one of the, I would say the biggest problem in the performance of buildings, uh, certainly in the United States and probably elsewhere, is the is the, uh, control systems, which are opaque and uh, programmed um, in the kind of same manner as as the moon rocket was programmed back in the 60s. Um, it's just simply an obsolete approach to controlling, which uh, shows great opportunity to be improved now that we have distributed processing and the internet, things like that. Um, and finally, dehumidification. I'm delighted that um, uh, Chandra covered that topic perfectly, and I won't talk about it. But clearly, uh, as with the overventilation, um, the dehumidification um, uh, being used as, as a um, be, you know, using the same coil for dehumidification and also cooling a space is something that has to be changed. So this, these are uh, findings from the CBE survey, which is a very large number of buildings. And I just want to point out that of the, um, um, when people vote dissatisfied uh, in the survey, 42% of people are voting in the, in the region less than neutral on their thermal sensation. This is pretty shocking. And if you consider 80% uh, of the population supposed to be comfortable if they follow standard 55 or ISO standard 7730, um, we find that only 11% of the buildings that we've surveyed um, actually meet that criterion. You can see here the people where buildings that had 80 to 90% or more uh, satisfied are, are very few and far between. Um, there may be productivity considerations from this. Um, I don't want to venture into that territory, but obviously if you've got 42% of the people dissatisfied with the thermal environment, there must, you know, you might have some kind of an effect. So the people who say, well, gee, we've got a pretty good situation now, we better not try something new, they're, they're playing around 
with a bunch of assumptions that they are doing well on productivity as well, and, and uh, perhaps they're, they're risking productivity now. Uh, energy use, we've seen, it's 40%. Uh, build, commercial buildings are half of that. The heating and ventilating is a total of 18% um, of, the, of the world's, uh, world's energy use, um, and it's not getting better with time. Um, so we, there's a lot, uh, this, this whole session and the, this whole conference um, is working on an extremely important topic. And um, the over-conditioning that I mentioned before is, is mostly um, in the United States and elsewhere, um, and, me, and even here, is due to overcooling. It was, is represented in terms of overcooling, though it has been found that the uh, summer temperatures are cooler in the U.S. now in commercial buildings than the winter temperatures. So you might argue that we're overheating as well. But the problem really shows up mostly in cooling. And you can see here um, uh, from the uh, data taken from the base database that um, it's all the data points are falling in the winter comfort zone, even though those data points are uh, year round. So, I'd like to posit that the most essential and promising changes that we could be making to practice is, first of all, is to get those data points moved out and spread into the comfort zones for summer and winter, and perhaps beyond. Um, and, and to do that, we're going to have to take advantage of air movement, uh, and that's been talked about here by practically all the speakers. Um, but I will talk about it a bit more too. And, and it's a good reason. Um, when you look at the psychrometric chart, which is, appears on every comfort standard, it includes the effects of temperature and humidity. And because they often use the term operative temperature, that means they also consider the long wave radiation in the space. And the only thing that's never in there is the air movement. Um, it's a variable, it's an architectural variable that we can play with, but it's not uh, taken advantage of in engineering mindset because they're moving energy from one box to another, and, they, and what goes on within the box is assumed to be uniform. Um, then the other thing is we, we have to uh, minimize the amount of ventilation that's used. Um, and this is something that Isiac, of course, would, <laughs> sounds horrible to say, but we're, using, we're getting plenty of ventilation in many of these buildings. Uh, we are overcooling for reasons, that we're overventilating for reasons that have nothing to do with the need for ventilation, but have to do with the need for mixing uh, from fit diffusers, and we'll talk about that. And then finally, we need to control solar gains. So these three things. So the air movement and the personal comfort systems are a subset here of the opportunity to expand the, comfort, the temperature range in buildings. Um, so this, this image of the opportunities to save energy, Richard Vadir showed an earlier version of it, um, shows a uh, potential to save HVAC energy, the vertical axis there, um, um, so adding up to, in a city like San Francisco, virtually 100% if you could um, operate the interior of the building within the ranges shown there. Um, this is a commercial building, it's a simulation, um, uh, the buildings have various characteristics, but a lot of um, simulations show the same effect. There are no ways, technically, that you can save this kind of energy uh, in anything else you can do in the built environment, uh, in terms of improving equipment efficiency or controls efficiency, any of those things. If you could expand the temperature range, your, your savings are the sum of the two curves here. Um, if you go to the cold side or the warm side, and you can see how that they add up very quickly. Uh, the way that you would get there, of course, is uh, down below here. Um, I think some of these are, are, are obvious. Um, I'm not getting any. Yeah, I'm not going to worry about this. Uh, in the three bars at the bottom, you can see that the um, oh, that's fine. Um, that that the, uh, to go to the warm side, you're going to have to add some some air movement. Um, you can use the adaptive approach a bit. Uh, to expand the central range, but beyond that you need something like fans. And then uh, there may be personal comfort systems which use fans also, but maybe other things uh, which could maybe stretch you out in this additional uh, direction. And the question then, are, are those, you know, comfortable environments or not? 
So here's our archetypical building of, of today. It could be a beautiful image in an architectural magazine, but basically it's the same thing as what you see here. Uh, all the conditionings in the ceiling plane, um, this overhead system, uh, all the air and the heating and the cooling are coming through those little holes in the ceiling there, um, the diffusers, and um, I will try this again, but oh, there you go. You can see the, there's, we've got a few diffusers here, a couple near the window, um, and um, they are uh, designed to promote mixing so that the people down below do not feel any air motion. Uh, and particularly, they're afraid of air motion dumping straight down from the diffusers uh, if there were too small an airflow. Um, you can also see the other thing that relates to personal comfort systems um, is that the thermostat on the column there, there's only one of them for this whole space with all these people who may vary, of course, uh, among themselves in terms of their thermal preferences. So um, looking at the ASHRAE database of um, all studies that were done, um, it was a, almost a, a surprise to find out that this gigantic percentage of people in buildings like the one I just showed you uh, want more air motion. And almost nobody seems to call for less air motion. Uh, the dumping hypothesis isn't seem to be borne out in the, um, in the overall data set. Um, and the notion for needing more air motion could be thermal, but it could be something else too. And so we'll talk about that. Anyway, so how, how, to, how to bring back air motion you know, into the, into the um, indoor environment. Uh, here are some of the um, ancestors of the Danish Technical University on their way to, to Britain um, in the year 800. <laughs> um, maybe do. And they're experiencing air motion and uh, thermal variability and alesthesia, presumably, in, in high doses. You can see the snow on the mountains and the wind is probably 10 meters a second at a minimum. Um, so the first step really was to get air motion integrated back into the standard in a way that it wasn't just an add-on for summertime. And, and so the ASHRAE standard now has a, 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 a computer model that um, starts with a PMV comfort zone at the still air um, region, which appears at the bottom of this thing here. This is the winter comfort zone. This is the summer comfort zone. Here's the, uh, of the increase in, in um, allowable temperature here due to the air motion increasing, the air motion being on the vertical axis. And um, th this change to the standard was based on a lot of field studies uh, as well as um, the SET model, which is, of course, developed by Gaggy back in the 70s, and which works, um, we feel, well for uh, predicting the effects of air motion. There is a zone within this zone which, where the, it does not have to be personal control over the air motion. It, you can simply supply it and, and rely on it to provide comfort uh, according to the standard. Uh, beyond that, you do need uh, local control, which is something defined in terms of the number of people controlling the fans. So that's one thing. You need to get the engineers to have a way to say this is okay in terms of their practice uh, standards. You also need to find some way of moving the air that's more attractive than the old uh, ceiling fans, which have a bad reputation. Uh, in the old days, the ceiling fans in the U.S. in the summertime would have a strip of a heat, a sticky paper hanging down to catch the flies, you know, and you kind of imagine people lying around drinking um, um, vodka or, or not, you know, whiskey in the south and watching the flies get caught under the ceiling fan. That's not an image that any modern architect wants to have. So you have to come up with uh, some kinds of products that look better. And there are indeed some that are getting to be pretty fancy. Um, some, pro uh, the, oops, the, um, some, some manufacturers are making them out of bamboo and, and, and gorgeous shapes. And the other thing about these things uh, is that they are DC motor fans which uh, run on unbelievably low wattages. Um, they're, they're running, to run this fan at a uh, velocity that will provide comfort to the people down below is about six watts. Maybe it can go higher, but not too much higher. Um, and um, and that's, that's an extremely low amount of, of energy to provide an amount of cooling that would require the central plant to use roughly um, 800 watts. It's a big difference. Uh, also, there's the opportunity for focus sources of air, and, uh, which only, uh, say, affect the upper body or the head or the facial region. Uh, and these 
uh, will may, in many cases will now start to not come from the building, but they'll come from the furniture. And so there's a whole opportunity for designers to be thinking in terms of uh, products uh, that sit in the workspace or furniture instead of kind of trying to build everything into the building. And the real lesson here is that this can be done uh, with the room air. Uh, the thing that has pretty much killed all the, in my mind, this um, personal ventilation and personal sources in the past has been the thought that we really have to somehow duct in outside air to come out of those nozzles. Um, uh, if that means that you have to uh, connect to a central system, you have to uh, go across several trades, you have to have a way of cutting holes in, in floors and furniture. It just becomes really difficult and expensive. And if these things could just be products that were part of every desk or every, uh, you, know, you know, just things you could buy, uh, it, it means that their utilization could become much greater and they could be cheaper. So do they work? So in pushing this thing forward, uh, you do have to do lab tests, of course. And here's a whole set of lab tests that were done at high temperatures and, um, um, and humidities by some of our colleagues or, um, in the lab. Um, and you can see that their, uh, the, the comfort region is above any of the normal humidities that are considered uh, acceptable in the US. Um, and that the, um, the um, highest uh, acceptable temperature range um, according to that air motion chart that I showed you at 1.2 meters a second, it runs along this dotted line. So one of the points actually goes beyond that dotted line. Other ones lie right on it or in that region there. And all of these um, conditions proved to be very comfortable. The only one that was at the edge was thermally comfortable but gave a sense of being too humid was the, was the um, 86, which is 30, 30 Celsius uh, and 80% RH. Um, that's way beyond any current practice uh, in, in architecture. Another thing is that some people would say, okay, thermally you're okay, uh, maybe they'll tolerate the moisture, but they won't, but there's a sense of uh, air quality that's gonna diminish because you go to those higher temperatures, air quality is supposed to go down. Um, that um, we dispute, we say, first of all, I think the, the, this perception of, of um, Poor air quality is more related to your comfort, which means has to do with your body heat transfer or body heat balance, not the air temperature in the room. Uh, if you're overheated, you may have a certain sensation, but you can be cooled not only by air temperature, you can be cooled by air motion. And so that um, is one uh, thing that I think has, uh, we think has been proven is that the, it's your comfort that's correlated to your perception of air quality, not the air temperature in the room. And, and this can be seen in, in these results um, in, in, in that um, as the temperature increases, turn this dot, here we go, um, from, uh, from cool uh, to warm, if you don't have any air motion, you'll see that above 25, um, you do get a drop off in, in perceived air quality. Um, it's quite strong. If you, however, can provide some kind of air motion uh, out of one of those little nozzles in the previous slides, um, it basically is statistically the same as if you're in a very cool environment. Your, your perception of air quality is, is not affected anymore by the high temperature. And, and so why would that be? So uh, there, uh, is, is it a psychological thing? Is it a perception of breeze being uh, clean or something, outdoor air being clean? Or could it have something to do with your body plume, which act, after all is a, a, a zone of polluted air that surrounds you? It's polluted by you, and maybe stuff that's been pulled up from the carpet. And so if you were to interrupt that body plume with air motion, perhaps you actually are getting better air quality without using uh, outside air. You're just using the room air, but it's better than the plume air, and the air motion is the thing that makes the difference. So we, we did this study um, trying to see whether uh, there is a difference in perceived odor coming from a, a patch of... Um, uh, a vapor patch which is attached to the, the, the belly of the person. Um, in the higher temperatures, this, you know, one does perceive one's odor. Um, if we could block that by using uh, something the equivalent of a Dutch collar, um, and indeed it did uh, reduce the perceived uh, odor 
um, uh, very greatly to put on that collar. And it might um, be perhaps some of the reason that people used to wear collars like that. I don't know. However, putting uh, air movement across there, 0.6 meters a second in the breathing zone, um, had the same effect as the collar, in fact, twice as strong an effect, uh, because it was simply blowing away the stuff that's near you. Um, so that is a, um, uh, that's a little hypothesis people should keep in mind, thinking of uh, air motion. Still, people would say, well, air motion is a second-class environment. It's, it's going to blow your papers around. It will cause some distraction. Uh, they're not thinking in terms of Richard's idea that some, dis that some difference is actually desirable. Perce you know, the imperceptibility is important. So this is a building that we have studied that is a net zero building. It's a lead platinum building. It is the highest quality green building uh, in Arizona. And Arizona is a hot, dry environment. And what they're doing is that they have ceiling fans in this building, and they are maintaining the temperature. Uh, they're not cooling. Uh, they're maintaining it 82, which is 28 Celsius. And that's well above any US kind of common usage. Um, the ASHRAE standard actually says that 28 is fine. Um, but no engineer believes it. They keep the buildings down in the comfort zone, in the winter comfort zone. Uh, here's that building on the um, cumulative uh, representation of all our buildings that we've studied. In, um, um, it with, the, with the CBE survey, and it's the thermal comfort response, and the building is very uh, successful. The building sits up here at the 91st percentile, um, and the, each one of these dots is a building, and you can see we have other kinds of buildings in there. These are lead buildings, and these are mixed mode buildings, and this building has the ceiling fans and is running at 82 degrees, and it's more comfortable than most of the buildings we've ever surveyed. So it shows that, you, that the air motion isn't a problem, uh, in fact, observation in that building shows that moving air, um, moving papers, uh, since it's, a, it's a actually a construction company and they have a lot of design documents there, moving papers is the only thing they comment as being a problem uh, of having the air movement. And that comment is that 5% of the res uh, occupants have responded that way. So it, it's, it's a, a problem that's probably less than most problems we encounter thermally. All right, so we've talked about air movement. Now I want to go briefly to um, pers personal comfort systems. Uh, they have all these wonderful benefits, uh, but they can allow us to widen that um, acceptable comfort range. Uh, they also allow us to use different kinds of building systems, which, you'll, you know, which is something we, um, designers will appreciate. So I'll show you a couple of them that we uh, designed and built in our lab and made enough, enough of them to use them in field tests, about, made about 100 of these things. Um, so one of them is a, like a one and a half watt fan that sits, I think it's, it's got a computer in there and so it, it, it adds up to about four watts uh, to run this not jet of air that runs about um, two meters, two and a half meters. You can put it in the corner of your desk and it blows at you. And to save the one or to four watts, we have an occupancy sensor on it so it doesn't blow when you're not in front of it. It also controls this foot warmer uh, because you want to warm your feet if it's a cold environment. And the nice thing about these things, they, they, have, they both have occupancy sensors. When you have a thing like this, you can monitor using this. You can measure the temperature of the thing, you can t see what the settings are that the person has chosen, and you can send the whole thing into the internet uh, via USB in this case or by some kind of wireless device, which we have on this next thing, which is a heated and cooled chair. And it also, it heats and cools you. Uh, it has an occupancy sensor, so it doesn't um, run when you're not on it. It runs on a battery for several days because the wattage is so low. Um, and it can relay the, the information about the person's uh, need for heat or cool uh, to the central system as well. In our case, we relay it to ourselves and we use it for our research. Uh, but it's, you know, you can imagine in the future, systems for building control could be responsive to their occupants' actual uh, behavior and needs. All right, so here's the, those chairs under, uh, under test conditions. And the bottom line with them is that it, you're comfortable with these things from 18 to 29 degrees. Uh, the 29 is always a tough temperature. Um, 
Uh, it's right on the edge of what's acceptable. 28 is, can be handled with air motion easily. 29 is always a little bit questionable. On the chair, we found that it was a little better to add a, um, a, a one watt desk fan that blows air just in the facial region. So together with the desk fan, we had people uh, at the 90% satisfied level um, at, um, uh, uh, at 29 degrees, just with the chair at that little fan. Five minutes ahead. Okay, so field studies have been done with these and, um, and people are very happy with them. Their comfort is great, their better comfort. Um, um, and so now I'm gonna just jump from the personal comfort system to this issue, I'm gonna describe it very quickly, of the overventilating of buildings, which is, um, uh, which in, in, in engineers' um, imagination is the most important, um, or it, 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 in the engineer's imagination, the, the fear of diffusers dumping on the occupants is throughout. It's, you can see it in the ASHRAE Handbook of Fundamentals. There's this constant stuff about maintaining the Coanda effect out of a diffuser. And the question is, is this really true? Um, and um, in this case, this is the whole Yahoo campus uh, in Sunnyvale. Uh, we were able to toggle the, the whole campus from a 10% minimum of maximum, so the maximum flow of a diffuser uh, we could drop it all the way to 10%, having a 90% throttling range. Or, of, or we could use the conventional 30% that the manufacturers recommend. Um, and so we surveyed the occupants and we measured the building. We, we tested other kinds of diffusers in the lab. And we found that, um, that, um, that actually comfort was getting better as we reduced the minimum. And, and the reason it was getting better is not because of dumping or anything like that. It had to do with that the buildings were not being so cold anymore. They weren't being overcooled by the excessive air coming out of the minimum flows. Um, we got very large energy savings, you know, on the order of 30%, just by reducing the airflow to these buildings when the loads were minimal. And this is the interesting thing. Uh, winter didn't really make much difference, but in the, two, in the summer season, in the Yahoo campus, and also in this other building called the Ferry Building, which was a, a, a large uh, kind of uh, uh, office building for the uh, attorneys. Um, we got a 50% improvement in comfort from our surveys of the occupants. 50% improvement in order and when you're saving 20% of the energy. So that's, that shows that current practice can use some improvement. All right, the final thing I want to talk about is, is, the, is the solar, the much neglected solar gain on people. Uh, peop animals of all sorts are, are percepting, you know, <laughs> perceived being overheated when the temperature is on the warm side. And the HVAC system ha is currently um, trying to pump out a lot of air out of buildings that are all glass with very little uh, solar control, like this one. So they spent a, a fortune in this building for a computer company to have uh, liquid, uh, what was called uh, water white glass, so they get the maximum amount of sun in for uh, the occupants of the building who they were very concerned or very interested in having have a perfect environment. There you can see the lovely picture of the way it looks. But in reality, a building like this, um, you know, people have to work in the building. And this is the way the building looks summer and winter. In fact, those sh shades never change. And there wasn't, uh, they, they replaced them with 95% opaque shades and it wasn't sufficient to protect the occupants. They had to tear all the shades out and go to 100% Black. So, so if you're able to lie on the ceiling, or I mean, sorry, you lie on the floor, you can look out the window. The rest of the time, this building is, is like being inside a basement. Um, so uh, this is an architectural error that goes on everywhere, and it's just um, uh, terrible, you know. So what can we do about that? Well, we should get into the standards, something that, where the engineer can say, hey, this um, building's got a lot of solar load. Um, uh, we, we need to deal with it, and, and, you, and you can't have that kind of a glass facade because I can't, with my HVAC, I cannot uh, cope with it. So at the bottom of this uh, web-based tool that, that you can all use, it's on that link there, um, this is the ASHRAE uh, comfort standard in computer form, uh, but at the bottom of it, we've added a tab, the SolarCal tab you can go to here, and it's not part of the ASHRAE standard yet, but it's, um, uh, it, it's something where people can play around and, and see what they can get 
uh, from the solar gain. So the, the, the main variables you have to enter if you're in the solar tab is you need to know what percentage of the person is going to get the sun, uh, you know, being above the furniture or below the furniture, and you need to have a sense of the, the diffuse sky radiation that the person can see from their seated yeah. position. Otherwise, the input parameters are all s standard. And what happens in the output is that um, you'll find the comfort zone just shoots to the left when a person is in the sun. And, if, and you can try putting more shades in and you'll uh, restrict the amount of air motion coming, I mean the amount of sunlight coming in, and you can bring that comfort zone back to the right side. But that's probably gonna be 15% of, to of total solar transmission. You're gonna need a really dense shade to make it work. So, in the summary, these are the things not to forget. Yes, we need a broader temperature range. It'll save us energy, it'll make people, and people still can be comfortable. We need air motion. Uh, the personal comfort systems work, and there's huge opportunities for many other systems like th that. Uh, if you are dealing with vi variable air volume systems, uh, the minimum ventilation rate can be fixed by just changing the control set point. You don't have to change any equipment whatsoever, and you're gonna, your fans are going to uh, love you for uh, not having to run all the time. And then finally, solar loads need to be controlled. Thank you. Okay, th with this, we have come to the uh, end of this uh, first uh, plenary session, or keynote session it was, I'm sorry. And we are very uh, pleased that so many uh, came here. And in fact, uh, Hugo is a little bit worried that there was nobody else at some of the other sessions, but uh, we'll have to find that out. So uh, with this, we conclude uh, this uh, session. Thank you.